I'm Troy Swift. I own Swift River Pecans, and I bought I bought my first farm in 1998. It was uh, 66 acres on the San Marcos River, covered with native pecan trees and improved pecan trees. And uh, so, as an example, that you don't have to start farming young. I never planted a pecan tree till I was 41 years old. So. Uh, a lot of people say they're 40 or 50, it's too late. It's not. We planted some more just this last February. And in 20 years, they'll look like the ones you see in these pictures today. The improved trees, not the natives. So anyway, that's the name of the business. We're in Fentress, Texas, which is east of San Marcos on Highway 80. Uh, we're, we're east of San Marcos, about 10 miles. And that is in what is called the Blackland Prairie. So we're east of the hill country, but the San Marcos River, of course, originates in San Marcos and the Blanco River uh, confluences with it uh, east of the hill country. The Blanco River is a hill country river. So on the, on the left over there, did that skip one? No, okay. On the left over there is what, what a native pecan grove looks like. So orchards are usually referred to if they're planted by man in, in rows, and groves are usually if Mother Nature planted them. At least that's the way I understand it. If you go to the redwoods in California, they call them groves, okay? So anyway, that's typical of what a, river, a, na a native pecan bottom looks like. Why do we call it a native pecan bottom? Uh, pecan trees inhabit the inside of river bends on the floodplain side, usually in deep alluvial soils. That's where they grow uh, naturally. Okay, now this map on the right here is the native range of the native pecan. So when you hear about pecans in Georgia and California, and Arizona and New Mexico and West Texas even, those are not native pecans. Those are man-planted pecans. That doesn't mean they're not good, but it means that, that they're not native. You can see that Texas and Oklahoma, you know, the eastern half of Texas and Oklahoma and Louisiana is really the heartland of the native pecan. The sad thing is, at least sad to me is, when it was named scientifically, it's named Caria illinoisis because it was discovered first first categorized scientifically on the southern southern end of Illinois on the Mississippi River. So it should be Caria texana or something more appropriate, but that's not what it is. Okay. This is my wife's favorite tree on our property. I wanted this here because I wanted to demonstrate to you that we have big native plants. This is not the biggest tree in Texas and it, even the pecan is not even the biggest native plant in Texas, as long as you consider live oak a native plant. They, they are actually bigger in circumference, maybe not in height. And the other, the other very large trees that grow in these river bottoms are cottonwoods. Cottonwoods get very tall. They get a they get very thick, and other the other spectacular tree is the bald cypress, which in central Texas and like even out here I see them planted around here. Uh, uh, in central Texas, they grow only on river bottoms. They don't you won't see them out in the in the countryside anywhere unless they were man planted. Very spectacular tree along the river. So this tree here on the right, that, that's the same tree from two different angles. By the way, that's me and Merlin Tuttle. Merlin Tuttle is one of the most famous bat scientists in the world. I'm going to tell you more about that later. Uh, and then this, this over here is the uh, 100th anniversary of the Texas Pecan Growers Association, which I'm now the vice president of. Anyway, I took them there. A lot of pecan growers don't even know what native trees look like. They don't understand that the trees they have in West Texas and Arizona are the size of the ends of our limbs on when you, when you look at a tree like that. When we were standing there with Merlin under that tree, I looked at him and I said, because we were 
you know, waiting for the picture to be taken. I said, Merlin, you know what you, <clears throat> you know what you say when you're standing under a tree like this? You hope the limb doesn't break off right now. Because those limbs are big. Anyway, we don't know the age of these trees. It's pretty well documented. They can easily be two to 300 years old, probably more and maybe in this case, which means the Comanches and the Tonkawas could have been eating the pecans off that tree. That means if you read a book like Empire of the Summer Moon, which talks about Texas Indian history, primarily the Comanches, it talks in one chapter, it talks about them walking down the San Marcos River on their way to Linville, which is now Victoria, to run the settlers out into the out into the ocean. That tree was there when they walked by. I find that incredible every time I'm there. Sam Houston crew could have camped under that tree. No, no telling. So what we're doing now, and one reason I guess I'm here is, is we changed our farming strategy about, about really about three and a half years ago to this regenerative uh, farming, which that word by itself, uh, there's all kinds of definitions and arguments and uh, e eco arguments about it. It doesn't matter to me what you want to call it. The fact of the matter is, I'm trying to call it smart farming. I'm, I'm trying to use the tools Mother Nature has run this planet with for the entire history of plants and animals. And I'm trying to use those uh, in coordination with Mother Nature rather than fiber. And in farming, that can be very difficult. First of all, farmers have paradigms they grew up with. I'm a little bit lucky in that manner because I'm a first generation farmer. I don't have the paradigms that my dad and granddad had when it comes to farming. I might own other things, but not farming. So if I make a mistake and lose a crop or, or get less of a crop or something because of a decision I made trying to, trying to use these regenerative techniques, I'm not gonna fire myself. But, a, but, a, but a, a farm manager that's working for a big business may get fired if they make a mistake like this. So a lot of people are reluctant to change because it's risky. And, it, and, and you know, the environment plays a big deal in it. If you change and it was in coordination with the drought or some other storm or something goes wrong, you can, you can lose the crop and blame, blame the wrong reason. So the idea usually is presented that if you're a farmer that's thinking about changing the regenerative techniques, don't do it all at once. Take a, take, take a few acres, do it, get comfortable with it. Don't, you know, don't put all your eggs in one basket early. I put all my eggs in one basket pretty early. <laughs> okay, but again, I'm not gonna fire myself. So what you see here, what you see here, in fact, I probably should be sitting out there and you up here talking to me, we're letting, we're letting our orchard floors grow whatever they want to grow. We've tried cover crops. There are specific cover crops, clovers and medics and legumes and things like that you can try to plant. But that means you got to make exposed dirt. And we don't want to make exposed dirt. And I don't know if any of you ever heard of a lady named Betsy Ross, and it's not the flag lady, but she used to run a company called uh, Sustainable Growth Texas. She's recently passed a couple of years ago. But she came here and knew I was gonna start talking about cover crops and she said, Troy, they're gonna tell you to plant cover crops. Don't do it. Just don't even worry about it because mother nature is putting them there for you right now. Mother nature knows what's deficient in the soil and she's growing the right plants to bring it back. In fact, if you grow plants that have deep tap roots, that is, there's a term for that called bio drilling. In other words, the roots go deep they increase the permeability of the soil by, by allowing, a, by forming channels that go into the soil. Then when the root dies and rots, it adds organic matter. And if you start doing soil tests and studying your soil science, the bottom line, and I've, I, I used to be in the aircraft in the jet engine business and had to do statistics and regression analysis and things like that. I did a bunch of soil tests and put those tools to work. It's really all boiling back to organic matter in the soil. That's, that's what it's really boiling down to. 
Haney test will give you all kinds of different numbers and things. And so I, I had to sit down and make a presentation on the Haney soil test just so I could understand it. But now I, I'm better at it than I was. Anyway, uh, that that uh, picture on the left is a brand new planting. We put those trees in the ground in, in February of this year, put 100, 110 more uh, cans of variety. Now, when I say varieties like that, what do you what do you mean by that? Well, first of all, let's go back to the native part of it. You'll be interested in this. It's very important that we conserve the native pecan bottoms wherever they are, because that's where the original uh, biodiversity resides. It's still there. There's no telling what undiscovered uh, undiscovered things we would we could learn there. Uh, and the whole history of the pecan industry is in those native pecan bottles. So everything was derived from there. But when you want to make an improved tree, a lot of people get confused. They think an improved tree is GMO. It's not. An improved tree is a grafted tree. That just means that controlled pollination has been going on for enough years to develop for a tree to develop the kind of nut and the kind of growth pattern that growers find uh, attractive, either from a, from a food perspective, a growing perspective, and mostly a profitability perspective. So we grow a lot of improved varieties. Now, improved varieties in today's world are typically American Indian names. That's why you'll hear Pawnee, Cheyenne, Choctaw, Caddo, Kansa, Oconee. That's why you hear those because the USDA, starting in 1955, when they released a controlled cross that they that met that met the criteria for uh, releasing it to commercial production, in 1955 they named they decided to start honoring the native, the native Indians and the Native Americans. And so the first one was Comanche. Why was it Comanche? Because most of Texas was Comancheria. If you read that book, you, you'll, you'll get that. But when we want to change the varieties, we have to graft the tree. There is advanced science where you can take cuttings and rootings and things like that, but it is not commercialized. Don't even try it. If you want to change the variety of a tree, you graft it. The way you do that is you go to a tree that you like in January or February, cut off a stick about the size of a pencil, both in diameter and length, a little bit bigger in diameter. Put about 10 or 12 pieces in a plastic bag, Write what you wrote, write the variety you put on the bag because you're not going to remember, okay? And and uh, seal up the bag and put it in the refrigerator between 37 and 42 degrees. That's where it needs to be. And so that stick goes into the refrigerator in the wintertime and it thinks it's wintertime until you pull it out on April the 15th, easy day to remember because it's tax day, and you start grafting. And if you want to know how to do that, you can go to my website. I have uh, uh, Texas A&M uh, grafting videos there if you want to know how to do it. An interesting thing, if you ever, if it, early in the spring, let's say it's uh, April the 1st or so, and, and a pecan tree leaves out and you don't know if it's grafted or not, there's an easy way to tell. Usually you can tell by looking at the bark will change or the diameter will change. But if you look here below the graft, you'll see the leaves are red. If a, if a young pecan, pecan tree comes out red or orange, it's not grafted. That's juvenile wood. Look at the leaves at the top, they're perfectly green. That's adult wood. Juvenile wood and adult wood have two different jobs. Juvenile wood, so everything below that white tape, everything below here, it thinks its job is to grow a tree as straight and fast as it can to get up into the sunlight and compete with the forest. The grafted wood above the graft is adult wood. It thinks its job is to make as many leaves and fruit as it can and branch out as often as it can. So now you have to manage an adult wood on a juvenile trunk, which means you have to prune the tree as it grows to make it be the right shape. Otherwise, it'll get all, it'll, it'll get uh, into an undesirable shape. Plus, you want the bottom four and a half feet 
available for your shaker to hook up if you're doing it commercially. In February of 2006, that was a grass field. So that's how fast you can grow them if you do it right. And doing it right means you, you do have to uh, have irrigation if you're gonna do it commercially. You do have to prune them, you do have to fertilize them, you have to spray them, and there's uh, a lot to grow in trees. But if you do it right, you can have them in production. The, the book says five to seven years. You can get a nut now and then in, in years even earlier than that. But the bottom line is about year 10 is when they start becoming commercially fruitful, where you would want to hook a shaker onto them and start and start harvesting the pecans. That orchard looks like in this picture, it's mowed, but it's not. So one of the regenerative aspects that we put into place is that we, we have reduced our mowing from making it look like a golf course all year, which is very expensive, both in diesel labor and mower maintenance, but it's also bad for the soil because now the 100 degree summer heat can hit the, hit the soil and, uh, and then there's erosion, plus we're not building as much organic matter. And so now we're not mowing. It's wonderful. We don't like mowing. But around the trees, you can see around the trees, We've done some mowing. We have to do a little bit around the sprinkler heads or they can't work. If the grass gets up in the sprinkler head, it just wraps it up and then it just doesn't work right. So we do have to do that. But right now the orchard floor is about 12 to 18 inches tall. And of course that's seasonal. And one of the interesting things that happened when we quit mowing is a, is a population of oats, wild oats came up that I didn't even know were there. So that, that's, a benefit, that's also a very beneficial plant. And now the earthworm population is incredible. This is what pecans are supposed to look like when they're on the tree. The one on the right is before the shuck is opened. They're supposed to be green and healthy looking like that. If they have black spots all over them or, big, or, they, or they're all the way black, that's usually pecan scab, which is a fungus. Which, which is very detrimental to the quality of the pecan. In fact, it can ruin them and make the whole thing not harvestable. You would know them as a stick tight. If you ever picked up a pecan and the shuck didn't want to come off of it, that's because there was something wrong with the shuck. And so it, it didn't go through its proper growth and release uh, uh, cycles. And so the, it, it's, it's called a stick tight and they're no good. Over on the, over on the uh, left side for you is what they look like when the shuck is opening and you can see the nut in there. When you see that, it's time to start thinking about hooking the shaker up. Now on early varieties like Pawnee, you gotta be all over this because guess what? The first pecans that are ready, everything else knows that too. And what else eats pecans? World. And what else? Deer, hogs, turkey, coons, dogs, coyotes. In other words, everything eats pecans. And if you're close to a road, people. Okay. There's actually laws in Texas about pecan theft. Mm -hmm. It's illegal for like if I if I saw pecans on the tree out here on the highway somewhere, it's illegal for me to go hook a shaker up and shake that tree. We have a question from the zoom. Okay. Um, how do you keep the wild animals out of the trees? Are you going to maybe you're going to address that? Well, the real answer is you don't. I don't. <laughs> okay. So the question was, how do you keep wild animals out of the trees? The real answer is you don't. There are techniques, especially with crows, where there there are crow cannons that make noise. Um, bird calls, you know, there's just distressed bird calls. Uh, there's things of that nature. And the crows will listen to them for about the first week. And then after that, I, in my opinion, they start laughing at them. Okay. Uh, crows are a problem too. Squirrels are really not as big a problem in an orchard environment as you think. They're a real problem in an urban environment because there might only be one or two trees in an area and they all know where it is and they go get them. 
in an orchard environment, we do see squirrels, but but even if you drive around down there for an hour, you might not even see one. You might too, but but it's not the biggest deal. The squirrel, the damage squirrels done is barking the tree. When you're growing young trees, they like to get on it and eat the bark off all the way around it. 15 minutes of them chewing on the bark, you've lost two or three years of growth. A tree will die from there up. That's why we don't like squirrels. The biggest problem that we have wild animal wise is feral hogs. Feral hogs are devastating. It used to be we could go in and shake trees like this, even those big natives shake them one day and harvest them the next, can't do that anymore. Now we have to shake the tree. We have to make sure the timing of the day so that the uh, shaker is not getting too far ahead of the harvester because the harvester has to pick up what the shaker put on the ground or you will lose the pecans. Plus they tear up the ground. So how do we do that? If you really want to know, it involves traps and guns. Okay. This is what, a, what the native orchard looks like when in the wintertime when it doesn't have any leaves on it. And that's what we call big shaky. Big shaky can grab a tree trunk 55 inches in diameter and shake the pecans off of it. It also shakes off lots of other things, big, big dead limbs, rotten limbs, coons, squirrels, whatever happens to be up there gets rather excited. And you can get excited in that machine too when it starts landing on you. <laughs> this is what a harvester looks like. A harvester is not a vacuum cleaner. It sweeps the ground with rubber fingers. It picks up everything on the ground, throws it on a series of, of chain link chains like you see there. And, and there's, there's blowers in there blowing out the leaves and the light stuff. And, and then the pecans fall through that screen into an auger and it delivers it to a bucket. And, uh, and then we dump, that, we dump that bucket hydraulically into a big trailer or a dump truck or something like that. It can be a very dusty job in dry, in dry conditions. That day, obviously, it's not very dry. Why is he wearing a helmet? Because the limbs will hit you. You have to get under those limbs. And we don't like to trim our trees up too high because those are pecan producing limbs. In our facility that we have on Highway 80, we, uh, we have a full cracking uh, and shelling facility. Uh, we have a pecan cracker that can do 400 a minute and we can do different sizes. We can, we can uh, do improves, we can do natives. Now, not all pecans crack the same. If you have a high quality Cheyenne, high quality Kansas, high quality uh, uh, Pawnee or something like that, they come out in halves pretty good. But if you've got natives, which, which are hard, hard for the uh, meat to release from the shell, you'll get a lot of pieces and your yields will go down. Over on the right, we have just installed our pecan oil manufacturing room. We remodeled our factory and put in our pecan oil manufacturing. What is pecan oil? Lower, lower in saturated fat than olive oil and a much higher smoke point, 470. So if you ever burn something in olive oil and you don't like that taste, try pecan oil. It's also very healthy oil. Um, and so you use it for cooking. People from the Middle East sometimes stop and buy it to put it in their hair. Sometimes people put it on their skin. But anyway, very high quality oil. And, and here's the deal. All it is is squeezed pecans. That's it. We put them in a press. It squeezes out the oil. The leftovers can be made into flour and, and pecan butter and things of that nature. But the oil, there it is over there. Wonderful stuff if you've never tried it. Cook with it, uh, stir fry in it, do your pancakes, do whatever you want to in it. Put it on chicken, salads, greens, things of that nature. That's what pecans are supposed to look like. Those are cans of pecans, super high quality pecan. And see the color, okay? If you go into the grocery store and the pecans are as dark as root beer, those are mm -hmm. bad pecans. They have not been stored right. The proper storage for pecans is frozen. 
buy them and put them in the freezer. They can go in and out as many times as you want to. And you just put them in the freezer. You want a handful for your for your salad, for your chicken, for your for your ice cream. You know, there's been experiments done to see if you can put too many pecans on a bowl of ice cream. It can't be done. Okay, it just can't be done. I've tried it myself. But if you buy those dark ones at the grocery store that haven't been stored properly, that's a problem for the industry and it's a problem for you because you're not going to like them. And so people that don't know about pecans buy those. They think that's what they taste like and then they don't want to buy anymore. We hate that. So part of our education is to tell people, freeze those pecans. You can do it in shell or shell. They'll stay good for two years. Wow. I have the same question. Okay. Um, how do you use the pecan shell after extracting the meat? What we do is use them in our... Oh, so the question is, what do we, what do we use pecan shells for? We use pecan shells to uh, uh, as an ingredient in our mulch and in our compost that we then spread back out on the orchard floor. So we're giving we're giving the we're giving that part back to the orchard floor. People do also buy it to use it for mulch and gardens. Ours is pretty crunched up. It's not big pecan shell looking stuff. It's it's more granular looking. And uh, so if you do that, use it on the surface, but don't till it in. It'd be just like tilling in sawdust, which can take nitrogen from the, from the soil right off the bat. Be good for you later, but not right off the bat, okay? So we use it for, uh, we, use it, we give it back to the, to the orchard floor. So if you set up a pecan business, you need to have high quality. This is a demonstration of high quality. We have one best pecan in Texas before. Uh, we're, we're in the running again right now that we won't know till the end of July who won that. But uh, you, what you do is you enter your county show. If you finish first, second, or third, you go to the regional show, which in our case is the East Texas show. When first, second, or third there, you go to the state show, and it's done by variety. So uh, so we have one uh, lot. All those, all those uh, blue ribbons are first place by variety. But then in the state pecan show, there is also the grand champ, which which we've won one. We got runner up uh, last year, and I'm hoping we won the East Texas pecan show this year with a Pawnee, and I'm hoping that one goes to the top at state. Stands a chance anyway. That's what our product looks like. We have some over here if you want some. <clears throat> We also do honey. We have 13 hives. I don't do the beekeeping myself. I have a, a if you do beekeeping, you need to be an enthusiast because it's, a, you got to either like it or you don't like it. And I kind of don't like it because it's hot. A lot of the work's done in the summer and they're trying to kill you. So I, uh, <laughs> I let somebody else do that. But we do sell honey that we have, that we do on our own property. And it, it's also, just honey. You put it in a spinner, spin it out, and no, no additives. You know, when you buy honey, if it crystallizes, that's a good sign that it's unadulterated. If you buy honey and it never crystallizes, it's probably got corn syrup or it's been adulterated somewhere to make it go further. So a lot of times you see people buy, oh, it's crystallized. I don't want it. It's actually a sign of good quality. You just you know how you get rid of it? Everybody knows you can put it on the stove and don't get it too hot. But the best way to get to make to make it go back to liquid is take it outside, lay it in the hot sun for about three hours. It'll be cleared up in, in about three or four hours. That's our pecan oil. That's a different bottle. We're going back to this bottle because it doesn't turn over so easy. Not quite as pretty, but you know what? I like. I like it to be functional instead of pretty. Is that also a glass bottle? It is a glass bottle. And so is that one over there. Uh, this is just a demonstration that everybody thinks pecans are for pecan pies and they are, but they're also for everything else. You can put pecans on anything and it's good for you. It's health food. Put it on your salads. There you go, put it on your salads, eat it with fruit. Just make sure you got good pecans. 
So we don't do just pecans. In the native, in the native river bottom, giant trees fall down all the time. So we installed a lumber mill. We have sawmills, kilns, big planers. We harvest the logs that fall down and put them on our sawmills. This is a big sawmill. This is a wood miser WM1000, which can cut logs up to 64 inches in diameter. We make giant slabs out of it. People buy it for big tables. Uh, they buy it for countertops, island tops. Uh, uh, breweries and wineries buy them for their bars and display areas. That's our kiln. One of, one of our kilns just circulates hot air, but we put that in there for three months to dry it out before you can use it. Kiln drying does five things for you. It makes it stiffer, it makes it lighter. It, it uh, shrinks it and it kills any bugs and larvae that live in it and it makes it where it'll hold a finish. If you try to put a finish on wet wood, it will turn white or flake off or peel or be ugly. Never build finished furniture out of wet wood because it will shrink and change your furniture. This is our planer. Our planer can make, oops. so here's how big a wood we can cut, all right? Our planer can handle a board 20 feet long and 55 inches wide. These are the kind of logs that we can handle. This is a native uh, pecan that came off the Brazos River. This was a furniture builder who wanted us to custom cut for them, which we also do. If you have logs, you bring them us, we cut them. That's what it looks like in the big picture. Really big stuff we can handle. Of course, it's not all that big, but that makes a good picture. <laughs> That's a slab that was cut out of one of those logs on that truck. That's how big they are. That's me me and Charleston Jackson, who's the main sawyer there. He's also a certified lumber grader. We, he, we, we sent him to uh, Memphis for a month of training on uh, National Hardwood Lumber Association training. But you can see the size of those things. There's some more of them. Now this one right here, that's right in front of my left hand is not pecan, that's actually bald cypress. And we got cypress, First of all, we never cut down any kind of trees. We don't cut down trees. We only take what mother nature knocks down or man knocks down, okay? So the floods of 2015 on the Blanco River knocked, at, knocked down cypress trees by the thousands and, and the water was so high, it put them all over everybody's ranches all the way downstream, including ours. And so we harvested those and, and uh, made big slabs out of those. This is a spalted, uh, a, a spalted piece of pecan. Spalted means it has those black lines in it, which is the early stages of decay. If you catch the wood before it turns soft, put that in the kiln, it kills that fungus and it stays that way forever. And no two pieces are the same. In fact, that's true of any wood. When we cut a big slab, we're the first person that ever saw that. Spalted wood is very interesting. A lot of people like it. It's been used, it's been used for centuries in furniture building. That's what wood looks like when it's stickered. Stickered means it just has sticks in it so the air can go through it so it can dry. There's another slab. So we do a lot of these kind of, now that's a, that's a hollow tree, okay? What do you do with a hollow tree? You make a mirror out of it. Or you can make a picture frame out of it. You could put a picture in there. If you don't like Aggies, you call it an Aggie picture frame. <laughs> you don't like, if you don't like UT, you, you call it a Longhorn picture frame. You just got to know your customer when you're trying to sell it. Okay. Anyway, that tree is probably another one of those 300 year old trees. And I shook that tree for 20 years and didn't know it was hollow. And it fell in a non significant storm. And I saw it and I didn't like it seeing it on the ground. I went over there and I said, we'll make big slabs out of it. I looked at the root. It was hollow as a pipe for 30 feet. So we cut it this way and made, made, uh, made uh, hollow, hollow rounds out of it. We make other things too. Those are cutting boards, trophies. This is actually a 3D topo of Texas. 
and uh, let's see. So our sustainability goals, I can't read them from here, but I know them pretty well. Um, we want to manage the water wisely. Water is going to be a big deal. It already is. It's going to be bigger and bigger. That's another thing about organic matter. The more organic matter you have and the more ground cover you have, the more water holding ca capacity you have. So again, it, it comes back down to organic matter in the soil. And, uh, and those are the things you can read there, but reduce fertilizer, reduce pesticides. And, uh, you know, trees store carbon. In fact, in the lumber industry, about five years ago, has been longer than that, I went to an NHL convention and there, and the lumber industry, their, their angle on carbon capture was, you know what, if you build a house out of wood, you stored carbon. And it's true. Otherwise, that carbon would have gone back if the tree had died or burned. Okay. So, so that's a that's how the lumber industry is doing it. The the ag, ag, the uh, orchard business is saying, look, we're we're storing carbon and growing it. Okay. But also now the way we're managing our orchard floor, we're storing it in the ground. Okay. And um Anyway, you can read those other things. That's what we're trying to do. Yes, that's it. So does anybody have any questions? Oh, it went on. Okay, what's your question? I was imagining that last slide. Let me get over here where I can see it. Oh, very good. Conduct soil health research. So we're, we are in, uh, uh, in an agreement with the Noble Research Institute in Ardmore, Oklahoma, a six-year study. And so this regenerative effort that I'm going is getting a lot of attention from scientists. And so they're coming in to do soil health analysis for six years, and that's Haney soil test and PLFA. And what those things do, uh, the Haney test uh, looks at soil respiration. So when soil organisms are living in the soil, they make CO2 just like we do, and that's measurable, okay? The other thing it does is it goes in and it says, look, if your crop advisor, in agriculture you have crop advisors, if your crop advisor says your crop needs 100 pounds of nitrogen a year, then look at your Haney soil test because it goes in and looks at those soil organisms and the work that they're doing. And it says, wait a minute, you already have 50 pounds. I mean, nobody was spreading nitrogen on those 300 year old native trees. Okay. So it says you already have 50 pounds of nitrogen because you have healthy soil. So even if you wanted to do hundred pounds, then only buy 50. Don't put out a hundred. Okay. Anyway, we're going to prove that we're doing a lot of things with them. Number one is they're going to they're going to continue the soil uh, testing, and also they are taking the nut. I've already given them pecans, and they're actually putting it in a lab to see what its nutritional it value. After is. And as we continue oh, over the next six years with this management style, we're going to see which management style makes the best pecan. So not only, not only are we trying to be smart with mother nature, we're also trying to make the best nutrition that we can. And the, and the saying goes, healthy soil makes healthy plants, makes healthy food, makes healthy people. How does native plant nutrition and the commercial one compare? I'm going to tell you that in about a year when I get those lab results back. I didn't have any natives to give them this year. I can tell you, though, that natives are very high quality if they're getting what they need. If there's water and sunlight and good soil, natives, natives are very good. But here's why we grow improved pecans. The way you grade pecans is if you, if you take one pound of pecans in the shell, put them on a scale, weigh them exactly and count them. 
Natives are going to be around 100 to a pound. It varies 75 to 120. But when you crack them, you crack them, put the meat back on the scale, what you would eat, and, and, and that's your percent kernel. So if you had one pound and it came back half a pound after you took all the shell out, you have 50% nut yield. Natives typically yield 38 to 42%. Improves, if they're good, are gonna are gonna deliver fifty-two to sixty percent, <laughs> and they're much yeah. bigger. And I, I documented so the, shell, um, the shells are thinner. I've documented about the the name, paper shell. things out here. So a good. paper shell is not a kind of pecan. Mm -hmm. A paper shell is a non-native, and depending on how paper shell it is, is is what people are interested in. For instance, a mayhan, which is a big long pecan, it's an old variety. One we all grew up with, you can grab them and crunch them in your hand, and mm -hmm. that's it, right? But a lot of times they're really dry. They're not really a very high quality pecan. They are when they're young. If it's a if it's a 15 to 30 year old tree, it might be a really good pecan. But if it's old like they are now, a lot of those were grafted in the early 1900s. They're dry. We don't grow those anymore. We have them, but I don't even harvest them sometimes. I just let them go. There's a saying that says and when you get dry pecans like that, particularly a mayhan, there's a saying that says a mayhan is the only pecan that tastes the same whether you crack it or not. <laughs> here's us doing wood chips around the base of a tree. If you if you want, here's a good book for you to read. Another one. It's really hard to remember the name of it. It's called the Wood Chip Handbook. <laughs> read the Wood Chip Handbook. It's a good something you can do with wood chips on the top of the soil. You don't have to compost them. Mother Nature will do that for you. Oh, that other picture, by the way, we get we, we go get uh, spent beer grains from breweries, mix it with our wood chips. Why do we do that? Wood chips are high carbon. It's hard to compost high carbon. You need nitrogen. Well, we're not going to go mow the grass and rake it up just to put it in a compost pile. So we go get spent whiskey and beer grains, which are 3% nitrogen, which is the same nitrogen value as organic fertilizer. Mix it in there and then let that compost naturally, okay? These though is a better way. And if you haven't heard of a Johnson Sioux bioreactor, then, then uh, look up Johnson Sioux bioreactor. This is how you make compost fast out of high carbon material. And so uh, what it does is it, it, ha it has pipes in it. You put, you, put pipe, you put PVC pipes vertical, five of them, and then you saturate your wood as you fill up this cylinder. And then after about two or three days, the hyphae of the fungus that's growing on the wood chips hooks it all together. You pull the pipes out, you stand it up like that. That's our irrigation system. You water it one minute a day. And it makes super high quality compost. In fact, I did six different recipes and the easiest one was the best one, which was just wood chips. Okay. And so what we do with that then is you can take a handful of that about like this and put it in a bucket of non-chlorinated water. Okay. And stir it up and it almost all dissolves. And so you can spray the liquid as you would a compost tea. That's the experience I've had. And there's us doing it, spraying compost tea on the right. Johnson, that's Johnson Sioux. Compost extract is a better way to say it. On the left is us spreading wood chips with a manure spreader. So what do you do? You take compost, high fungal compost co extract made from wood chips, you spray it on the ground, and then you cover it up with wood chips for it to eat. And that's what we're doing to improve our soil health in, a, in addition to having a good ground cover all the time. Want to keep the beneficials? I, I walked around out here, big deal out here on, you, this is a beautiful place, by the way, and there's a lot of talk about pollinators and beneficials out here. That's all true. And uh, so I need to get over here where I can see what that says. Yeah, 
So we spray only when necessary, and we do have to spray. There are, there are things that can happen to you that can take the crop. One of them is pecan nut case bearer, which is what we just went through that phase right now. Um, but we're trying to get where we don't have to do that. And how are we gonna do that? Well, we wanna keep our beneficials. We wanna keep our beneficials healthy. How do you keep beneficials healthy? Have a biodiverse orchard floor. Beneficials have to eat something. So here's a story I learned. If, if uh, uh, you, you can buy those, those wasps, you know, those parasitic wasps that, that lay eggs on worms, on larvae, right? So uh, at, listen to a man called Dr. Joe Lewis. Incredible podcast. But what he tells you is, you go buy that card of those of those parasitic wasps and you put them out in your garden or in your orchard, that female wasp hatches. She decides she's got to go lay, parasitize an egg or a larvae. She goes and does that. And then she looks up and goes, guess what? I need something to eat. Well, she doesn't eat bugs. She eats nectar from flowers. And if your orchard floor doesn't have any flowers, she hits the road because she has to. So biodiversity is a big deal in and around your orchard. Oh, by the way, we eliminated herbicides three years ago. Herbicides are used widely in pecan farming and we completely eliminated it. Now, you say, well, how do you handle around the trees and the sprinkler heads? Well, mowers and weed eaters, that costs probably a little more than herbicide but it might not because herbicide is also very expensive and it takes labor to put it out and the machine that you have to do maintenance on. So I think it pretty much washes out, but it, but it's certainly better for the soil to not have herbicide on. This is Dr. Dingra right here. He's the head of horticulture of Texas A&M. Who ever heard of the head of horticulture of Texas A&M, one of the biggest agriculture universities in the country to come out to Troy's place and help him plant trees and he did it and the reason he did it is because we met at a at a uh he, he puts on this thing called spirit of learning at a m where where they're really studying the wine industry and drinking wine spirit of learning okay you drink wine at the spirit of learning but in the morning, he's early riser. I am too. We met up. We met up in the breakfast area at a hotel and started talking about biochar. And he is an expert on biochar. So he said, "You know, Troy, I've done apple trials in Washington where we put biochar in the hole when we plant the tree, and and uh, I want to try it on pecans." And I said, "Okay." First, I said, "Oh." plant 20 trees and we'll try it. Then I said, we'll plant 50 trees and I'll try it. And then I said, we'll plant 110 trees. So we planted 110 and we did a big experiment. By the way, you see the, the, you see the, the cage around the tree and the stick sticking up in the air? The cage around the tree, if you're gonna grow pecan trees in our part of the state, you have to have a cage or the deer will kill the tree. You can't grow trees without a cage. The stick is for birds to land on. So when your tree is growing and you're pruning your tree so you have a central leader, and when you get real rapid growth, you know this because you're gardeners, you do get real gr rapid growth before the, the growth gets lignified. In other words, before it turns brown and gets bark, it's very fragile. If it's the tallest thing in the field, the hawks, the crows, the mockingbirds, the redbirds, and every other bird's gonna to wanna to land on that and they break them off. So you put a stick and they'll stand, they'll sit on top of the stick. My wife took, took her binoculars this morning and saw two crows down there standing on, standing on top of those sticks. So that's just a little trick if you're having trouble uh, with things breaking off new growth. Can I ask a question? Uh -huh. What is biochar? Oh, what is biochar? That's a good question. Bi biochar, you need to know this, it's exciting. Biochar is pyrolyzed organic material. Now, what does that mean? 
That means you take some organic material and it can really be any organic material, but in our case, it's wheat, but it can be wood, it can be anything, and you burn it without letting it have enough oxygen and it and it 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 looks like that. I mean, it it looks like uh, it's just black powder. It's just black powder, but it's extremely porous. What it does is it holds water. But the more exciting thing is is it provides a house for microorganisms to live in. Uh, way more than regular dirt does, and it's and. So we did an experiment and here's our experiment. We did, we, and I had him, the, the head of horticulture at Texas A&M designed this experiment. That's the shape of the orchard and you see the different color zones. And so we put 10% biochar back in the hole with the dirt, calculated the, the area of the cylinder of the hole because you drill it with an auger, calculate that, and then we filled it back up with 10% or 15%, two different experiments of the same kind of biochar, and then 10 and 15% of a different kind of biochar, which has fly ash from the paper industry put in it. And then I said, Dr. Dengra, we have to do an inoculation trial. So we inoculated it with 10 and 15% of Johnson Sioux compost. Now we're measuring growth and we're going to see which is the, is the best way to get a tree to grow. Also, by the way, biochar, uh, biochar puts carbon back in the soil forever, essentially. This is, this is uh, Merlin Tuttle on the left and me. This is us studying the bat house construction. Merlin Tuttle came to my orchard with a bunch of other scientists one day. You hear how many times I say I'm hanging out with scientists, right? Noble, A&M, Merlin Tuttle, and, and Texas State, too. In fact, we're having an event on June 15th, if you're interested, with Texas State. That's because I like to hang out with people that are smarter than me. If you hang out with people that are smarter than you, you get smarter. So that's what I like to do. Anyway, he came and said, you know, Troy, this pecky cypress, which, see that cypress has, has slots in it? That's caused by a fungus when cypress trees grow and it's called pecky cypress. He saw that, he said, he said, Troy, that's the best bat house material I've ever seen. And he's the most famous bat scientist in the world, in my opinion. He's credited with saving the bats at the, at the bridge in Austin, if you've ever seen that. He's also saved Bracken Cage Cave, which is the largest assembly of mammals on the earth. If you ever get a chance to go see that, I assure you, you cannot count to 25 million. And that's how many bats they think are coming out of there. So we started building bat houses and putting them up in the orchard. And uh, there's two types. So, so now here's another scientific experiment. We built two different models. We painted half of them and we left the other ones unpainted. And we painted them the same color as the wood so that the bats didn't, theoretically didn't see a different color. We wanted to know if a sealed up bat house was better than one that was a little more porous. So that one over there you can see is a tall skinny one. And this one over here is kind of a flat one. That one over there is called a rocket box, and this one over here is called a zent box. He wrote the book called The Bat House Guide. If you ever want to know how to build a bat house, you can get the plans out of there. So here's what we've done. We put eight bat houses in each orchard. Half of them are rocket boxes. Half of them are zent boxes. Half of them of each model are painted, okay? And guess what? I used to sit at the only factory in the world that made a particular part for jet engines. And I worried about that under fluorescent lights in front of a computer. And I was the boss of about 600 people. Now I count bat guano. 
So I go under these boxes and I see if they're occupied by seeing if there's back one over there. And we pick that up. Well, not exactly. I usually use a glove or a stick or something, but we put it in a vial and we're sending it to the Noble Research Institute again. And we have determined that this particular species is evening bats, which is a tree living bat. Okay. And they like these bat houses. And the highest count I've seen come out of it is 96 out of one of those rocket boxes. And that was just the other day. We're now filming them. I'm going to show you that in a minute. But why are we doing this at all? Why do we want bats? We want, the, we want them as insect predators. And what is our main insects on pecans? There's two different moths. The pecan nut case bearer, which I've already mentioned, and the hickory shuckworm. If you've ever... You would never know a pecan nut case bearer because if they get the pecan, you'll never see the pecan because it happens when they're little, this big, right now. But a hickory shuckworm, that's when you get one of those pecans that really doesn't want to open. And then when you open it, it has black stuff in the shuck and it doesn't want to let go right there. That's a hickory shuckworm. They also damage the pecan. That's a moth that flies at night. Both of them are moths that fly at night. We use pheromone traps to catch the pecan nut case bearer, and that way we know when they're there and how bad they are, and we scout literally with a 15x looking at the end of nutlets to see if there's an egg there. We do all of that and find if the economic threshold is there to spray or not spray. I want the bats to hold us under the economic threshold so I don't have to spray. I don't want to spray. I hate spraying. It costs a lot of money. It's not, it's not fun. Spraying trees is not fun. It's, you know, some people like mowing the grass. When you mow the grass, you can turn around and go, wow, that really looks good. I did something. When you spray a tree, it looks like it did right before you sprayed it. And, and it, it just isn't very, it's not very fun. Anyway, so we, we put these bad houses up. And, and so we call them the night shift. The bats are the night shift. And we have uh, firmly established colonies in both of our orchards. But not in all eight houses. They like to move around. They'll go in a house for a while, then they'll move to another house, then they'll move to another house, and they'll go back to the one they, they liked before. But they've been there now for a year. And we did a bat, we've done two bat studies there with Merlin Tuttle, where People came in from all over the country, and they and and then we hired these scientists that set up nets, and we caught four species of bats, and they also have computers and microphones and sophisticated electronics, and they can identify species by their sounds in the night. So we identified eight species at our farm. So I've been on the San Marcos River since 1978, camping, fishing, canoe, and canoe racing. I never knew these things were even there. It's amazing. Mm -hmm. And the red bat is the one we caught the most of. They're a tree, they're a tree bat also that will not inhabit a bat house. And you know what they do? In the daytime, they're red. They're, they're about rust color, like a about like a leaf that's died on a tree. So they go hang on the tree and look like a dead leaf during the day. That's how they do that. So I learned a lot about bats in the last year. We're having another event in September. You can look at our website or Mer Merlin Tuttle's Bat Conservation. If you're really interested in bats, go to Merlin Tuttle's Bat Conservation. You can sign up for these things. Uh, it's it's uh, But you gotta like being in the woods, the tall grass, in the woods at night. If that's not for you, don't come. Okay. Yeah. I'm talking about now, not, not a long time ago. All right. So th this time, I think this really is the last slide. And, and that's the Noble Research Institute, some of the scientists there. And so we're, we're doing the... Uh, we're doing the six year study. We're doing the soil health. They also do leaf analysis where they take the leaves off the trees and uh, see what they're made out of. See, see, see how well our roots are working. And uh, 
see how well our microorganisms in the soil are working. And you know, if you wanna really get into that, that's complicated. It's fascinating too. You know, trees actually have living plants, have living organisms in them. They're called endophytes, okay? And they can be good or they can be bad. And so if you have healthy soil, this, the, the root sucks in particular species of microorganisms and with superoxides, strips the cell wall off, steals the nutrients from the organism, kicks it back out into the dirt and says, get well and come back. That's what we didn't know very long ago. So this science is going really fast. I'm really involved in it. And I think my orchard is starting to show the results. Why did I start doing this? I had sick trees. I had a group of sick trees that were 10 years old and they, they started dying. And I couldn't figure out why. I was doing everything I was supposed to. I was spraying them with zinc. I was giving them nitrogen. I was irrigating them. I was mowing them. I was cursing at them. I was doing everything you can do to a tree and it was still dying. And I asked the scientists, come tell me, what's wrong with these trees? I don't know. There must be something wrong with the soil. I said, well, what is it? Well, we don't know. And I said, well, it's time for somebody to go learn about what's wrong with the soil. And uh, there's a lot of soil science and a lot of interesting stuff out there. Okay. Any questions before I show the bat, ha the, the bat video? Which one is the bat like this, the painted or the unpainted? Well, that's the big question. And the answer is they like both of them. Generally, they are liking the rocket box style better. In that picture, it looks like a little box. It's this tall, 20 feet off the ground, it has two chambers in it. And so the reason it's that tall is so they can find any thermal condition available in that box. If they wanna get warmer, they go to the top. If they wanna get cooler, they go to the bottom and it has a vent at the bottom as well. You'll see that in the video. They can go to the shady side, they can go to the inside chamber, they can go to the outside chamber, and they can go so up and down, all the way around, inside chamber, outside chamber, and never leave the box. It's a pretty sophisticated box. How big is it? 44 inches tall. Thank you. I couldn't see it. Yeah, it's 44 inches tall, and the other one's about 30 inches tall. Are you still selling those to your facility? We are really just now starting to sell them. Uh, I didn't want to go on the market with bad houses I didn't know worked, and now I know they work. So we're starting to take orders now, and uh, and Merlin Tuttle is very pleased with our bat houses, uh, and uh, and as a result of him being pleased, there's going to be other people that want them. So yeah. So back to the trees, I have two questions. One was. What do you, any advice for the residential pecan tree grower? And then the other one was, so if the soil had issues, what did you, after you called in the scientists, did they come up with a plan to try to regenerate the soil? What did you do? Or did they just recommend planting the native plant to let Mother Nature do its thing? The conventional scientist said I needed to go get a backhoe and dig up the roots and see what was wrong. I said, I don't want to do that. This is a 10 year old tree. I got, I got time and money invested in this tree. I started asking questions. Here's how it really started. I'll know when you get bo bored when people start leaving. Here's how it really happened. This, this happened, I started on my own doing soil science and, and really I was looking for cover crops, things that would produce nitrogen and and uh, mycorrhizae. I started calling another scientist. In fact, it's this tall guy in the white shirt right here, Bob Whitney, very respected agronomist in Texas. I called him and, and he's now, by the way, the first organic extension agent at Texas A&M. Okay. So you see, you know, on the radio shows, you hear a lot of bashing at Texas A&M. Oh, one of them land grant universities and, you know, they, they're starting to get the message and I'm giving it to them. And also Dr. Dingra is 
involved now, okay? The biochar thing is really a soil health thing, okay? Uh, anyway, he, he said, man, you, I called him about five times. He got tired of me, I guess. And, and he said, you need to go visit a man named Dennis Purs who has an orchard in uh, Georgetown. Not on a river bottom in an old cotton field run down, not a good place for a pecan orchard. And but it's about 30 years old, the orchard parts of it is. And I got out of the truck and never had met the man. I got out of the truck. He was over in the barn. As soon as I got out of the truck and started walking on the ground and looking at his trees, I said, there is something good going on here. And then he told me what he was doing. And then I was on board. So I started doing what he did, which was worrying about the soil health from a biological perspective. And the only way you can do that is take samples that are expensive and send them and get them tested for, are they alive or not? That was before I ever heard of Haney. So I went to the Soil Food Web New York where they literally take your soil, put it under a microscope, count organisms and tell you what they are in the ratio of bacteria to fungus. Now, that the theory is in an orchard floor or a forest floor, you want a high fungal soil. In a, in a grass area, you want a high bacterial soil. But look, I grow trees and grass, so I want both. I want a good balance. So we worried about that, started increasing the organic matter. And then he also said, you need to balance the soil chemically. And so we looked at it chemically and found that this was also an old uh, uh, cotton field where I am, except it's on a river bottom, but uh, it was deficient in phosphorus. And so we put a little bit of that on there. Now these trees are looking pretty good. I'm not calling them out of the woods yet. That's a tree joke, out of the woods. I'm not, I'm not calling it out of the woods yet, but, but they look a whole lot better than they have been looking and they have a crop on them right now. They have a crop coming right now. So, so healthy living soil and balance the minerals is what we did to answer your question. Now you can't get organic. You don't. You don't just say oh, tomorrow I want more organic matter. It takes a long time. You have to add it. Oh, another thing. I hired this Betsy Ross lady. She's famous, by the way. Look her up if you want to know in regenerative world. But. The first time she came, she looked at my soil analysis and she and she sold products for regenerative organic. She was all the way organic. And she said, she looked at my soil samples and she says, Troy, I don't even have anything to sell you because your organic matter is too low. If we spray bugs out there, they're going to starve to death. She said, the first thing you need to do is put out humates. I said, humates? I don't even know what that is. I mean, I know what humus is. I mean, I knew kind of what it was. It's something in the dirt. But what is it really? It's really just about coal. Okay, humates, humates, they mine. And she told me to get them out of New Mexico. So I did. I bought an 18-wheeler load of them. And it was something you could put in a fertilizer spreader and spread carbon is what you're doing. Now I use liquid. Now I use liquid humates. So that same sprayer that you saw me spray in the Johnson Sioux, I'm also spraying humates and do that two or three times a year. That gives car that gets carbon in the soil and uh, makes it makes it where the soil organisms are happy and have food. Okay. Do you supplement your native flower areas with seeds or just let nature reseed? And what kind of wildflowers do you have? We let Mother Nature decide all of that. We do not, we do not spread seeds. Uh, again, the reason I've tried it even, even, with a, even with a seed planter, but unless you have bare dirt, it's hard to get this. It's hard to get the soil seed contact and we just don't seem to get very good germination. Okay. So, so, but the answer is we have a lot of horse herb, uh, in the in the summertime, we have we have a lot of horse herb, which I've even seen you can buy in nurseries. Uh, it grows it grows natural there. We have we have the regular uh, native 
native uh, Central Texas flowers, and I'm I'm not good at those species, but but there's there's quite a few. And then um, I know you talked about what fertilizers you use, and then the question was, what do you use for fertilizer, and when do you use it during the year? For pecan trees. Uh, what I have evolved to is a late March, early April application of either an organic, uh, an organic fertilizer. Uh, Medina, Medina Agriculture has a new one out that's a little higher in nitrogen. Uh, it's a, it's an actually nine percent, which is pretty high for an organic fertilizer. I've tried that. I have one, one uh, three acre. Uh, block on on pretty much all organic just to test it and see what I can do with it. Uh, but otherwise, I will use a conventional fertilizer with with micronutrients. But remember when I said the Haney test, you can study the Haney test and reduce your nitrogen. I reduced it by half. So I'm only putting out half of the fertilizer I used to put out. What drives that? Well, I don't want to I'm starting to believe that high nitrogen is probably not good for the soil life. That's pretty much evident in the science. And the other thing is fertilizer is extremely expensive. So if you don't need it, you don't want it. Yes, ma'am. Do you have to use predator parts on your fat houses or the opening so small that it Snakes can't no, we do use a. You don't see it in the film, but we we made a conical, we made a conical screen out of quarter inch hardware cloth. It's really not hard to do. You cut a three inch hole in the middle of it, make a big circle, cut from the outside to the hole, and the more you fold it up, the more conical it gets. And then you just hook. We just hooked it to the pipe with hose clamps. And so that keeps the snakes out of it. Snakes are a main predator. And it also makes it an easy place to observe and collect guano because the guano falls down and sticks on there and that way you're not on your hands and knees. Okay, so welcome back Zoomers. This is a, this is a rocket box. This is in the morning, right at daylight and the bats are returning. So you'll see. Hopefully we'll see some emergence later on, but this is what it looks like when they come back, which is more exciting than at night. <clears throat> and if you watch closely, you can see the, they seem to be swarming randomly, but now and then you'll see one actually go in and they'll do that until, until 80 or 90 or however many bats this is are gone. So in about, 15 or 20 minutes, and we're not gonna watch this that long, but in 15, 20 minutes, they will all be gone. And they've all gone in that house. <laughs> we don't know. I call, I, I call that a touch and go. <clears throat> and I don't know, I asked Merlin about that. It, it, it could be that somebody's in the way because they're going in a three quarter inch slot. <laughs> They like to be in a three quarter inch slot. So it could be that there's somebody in the way. It could be that, I don't know, they didn't get a grip. It could be they're delivering a bug to a baby. It, you know. So they have babies. Oh yeah. Yeah. Well, let's show you that one we watched a while ago where the top of that box was glowing with heat. We think that's because it's full of babies. Because the bad house had all night to cool down. So it should be cold, but you get there at six o'clock in the morning, put that thermal camera on it and the top of the box is hot. That means there's something in there hot and that means bats. So we think we think it's full of babies at that time. Yeah. And just to clarify, these are non-migratory bats, is that right? Evening bats are semi-migratory and don't get me going too much on bat expertise because I'm not that much of an expert. I know what these are doing. I don't even know what these are doing. <laughs> really? <laughs> they're coming home is what they're doing. But now see that picture? You see how hot the top is? Yeah. That is because we think it's full of bats all night long, which means they didn't come out, which means they were babies. So they kept the top of the box. See this line right here? 
that's a vent. That's a three quarter inch slot so that heat can come out. And so you can look in through there and see it's warm inside. And then the higher you go, because heat rises. And if you watch this closely, it's pretty interesting. See how they go in there? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so we think that's full of babies. Now, this box happens to be, um, this box happens to be box 14. And they're not in this box anymore. And this was just taken two weeks ago. They've moved down to a different box now. In fact, they moved out of this box and just went over two boxes to, to box 16. And then they moved to box uh, 12, which is down at the other end of the orchard. But that's what you see if you get up in the morning and have a thermal camera. You can also see it without a thermal camera. Maybe parasites or something build up inside the box so they move to a new. That's another theory is that they have mites or something that they, a hygiene issue that they just say, well, look, there's a other house right over there. Let's just move. But I have, an, I have a friend in New Braunfels that we put up two houses down at his orchard and they've never moved. They moved in right away and they've never moved. But it, it might be that I have too many bad houses. It might be that they just have so many options that they just take advantage of it. Now, just because you put up a bad house doesn't mean you're going to get bats. People ask, how do you lure bats in? You don't. They either, they find it, and if they like it, they're going to move in, and if they don't like it, they're not going to move in. And it's just like you. If you have a perfectly good house, and somebody offers you the house next door, but yours is perfectly good, you're not going to go through the trouble. You're not going to move. But if your house burned down, or if you lived in a barn that got knocked down, or a tree that fell down, and you're looking for a house, somebody puts one up, you're going to move in. I appreciate your time. Uh, please go to my website if you have any more questions, or you can always call me, and I'm happy to talk to you some more. Oh, thank you. Thank you.